the most inaccessible valleys of the Caucasus are the swamps. The swamps. Swanithians. They're stone towers of blood revenge. Towers of blood revenge. <laughs> nah. You'll see. Okay. The ruins of Sebastopol. So this guy in 1873 traveled around this region of the world and wrote about it. I found it quite interesting. I think you will too. How he came across so many ruins in these areas that are basically desolation. So he talks about the gigantic ruins of Sebastopol. There's perhaps, he says, no spot upon earth which after an interval of nearly 20 years so fully exhibits the spectacle of complete desolation as Sebastopol. So it's like Strasbourg or Paris. It presents the same appearance as on the day after the last attack. Scarcely a house in the town has been rebuilt. Every step is amongst ruins and on the opposite side of the harbor barrack walls. See, everything's all military back then. This is the late 1800s. Hardly anybody going around doing anything. They have a couple of hotels that put up foreigners. And this was a German fellow traveling around through this area of Europe. And he came across some people who remembered the golden age. They lamented bitterly the Golden Age, and they don't get they didn't get that many visitors, regardless of what they say. So I basically read this whole book, and I took out these parts to show you highlights of it. And there's uh, quite an interesting microphone. There we go. Quite an interesting um, lesson in here to just show you what things were like back in the day. So it's a mountainous area and they went on many excursions and traveled around. Kind of like if you watched the movie Around the World in 80 Days, that type of thing. It's kind of like that. And he checked out history, checked out architecture, all the same stuff that we are interested in. So buckle up, stay tuned, pour yourself a cup of joy and just enjoy He talks about the Tartars. Every once in a while, there's a Tartar girl, the first one, the first that he sees. And he comes across what he calls the Eastern Customs. Graveyards, everything's in a state of complete ruins. The stone fences even have been destroyed. The tombstones, in many instances, were rolled down and broken to pieces, and the monuments injured, whilst in every direction weeds have accumulated. A sad contrast to the well-cared-for Russian cemetery on the north side of the bay. See, why would they destroy cemeteries and headstones and gravestones? Well, it's to hide the history. They had well-cared-for fortifications. It was all very military at the time. Throughout this whole journey, the whole book I read, it was very clear that everything that existed, that was allowed to exist at the time, had to have some kind of tie to the military. It doesn't explain everything, but it's just a common thread. So, he says here, A day's excursion to the fortifications will suffice for the ordinary tourist, but the military traveler to whom a visit to these local uh, historical localities will be of special interest should devote several days to a detailed inspection of them. So this is the Crimean region, okay, after the Crimean War. And this guy's not very suspicious. He's pretty much a normie and nothing too strange uh, that, that he's remarking about. But he does take interest or take notice in some things that I also find interesting. He talks about birds. He talks about just basically covers almost every typical subject of interest here. He talks about the absence of all evidence of modern civilization. The town has become imbued with a thoroughly oriental character, more so perhaps than the generality of towns in Turkey. And this is especially conspicuous from the circumstance that the edifices have all existed in the time of the last Tartar Khans. 
and have undergone no restoration since that period. So we had told our driver to take us to the Palace of the Khans, but so they eventually make their way there. It's not all that impressive, but there are some interesting things to be covered, which I will cover. It's it's quite a it's quite an, an a austere trip. There's really not much luxury that or civilization that he comes across. He talks about forbidden ground. Roads are marked off for target practice. They're basically training military by destroying the buildings, is what they say. Uh, so he was told not to walk across certain parts of the city. This is a completely empty, built-up, probably fabulous city of wondrous architecture. And the sound of cannonballs rang in his ears. A cannonball struck the ground about 50 yards to our left, fortunately without causing our destruction. So they have military. It's basically just occupied by military and their training, and their training is to destroy the architecture, you know, firing off rounds and that type of thing. And that's the reality of, like, that's probably the Crimean War in a the nutshell there. Uh, the Bay of Balaklava makes me think of Baklava. <laughs> But beautiful area, picturesque, ravines, valleys. So right off the bat. So that's right from the beginning. You can see where it's going. The coastline was still as death. Just not a village or hut was to be seen. Occasionally the ruins of a destroyed fort. The tranquility was almost unearthly. Especially when we, when we, when we remembered that the mountains were formerly the home of the numberless Chechukis tribes, who, after their subjugation in 1864, expatriated themselves almost to the last man. For it is certain that not less than 400,000 souls migrated hence into Turkey, there to perish from misery and starvation. It can only be supposed that this was the result of prolonged agitation on the part of the Turkish agents who must have held out to them to the most brilliant inducements. So this is the story he's been told, and he's buying it. But obviously he's coming across architecture and, and infrastructure that would support 400,000 people, but there's not a person to be found, only just some military firing off shots destroying the architecture. They don't seem to yearn after the bloody tyranny, blah, blah, blah. So he's talking about politics. According to the testimony of the Prussian, I think it's Prussian officers, civilization required the sacrifice in this part of the Caucasus has in consequence suffered by it. At the present time, the country lies desolate. But how long? But this I came across to me, it was poisoned land. To attract the European settlers here for the first generation would undoubtedly succumb to the fevers. So everybody who traveled there got this fever, like dang fever, that dang fever. But you, you get the sickness just being in the area, and you get over it. And I think it was toxicity. So at the time, he said, when the virgin soil is being first brought into cultiv cultivation, is doubly dangerous. I think it's because it was poisoned. It may, however, be reserved to future generations to witness this bounte bounteously luxuriant territory blooming with produce. Now, I watched a movie, most of it, very similar to this book but it, it's uh, like a hundred years later it's i think it was made in the 1960s and um what was it called hang on let me look it up it's free on youtube and i watched maybe the first almost half of it but i read about it a little bit but it's very similar it's a black and white movie in russian stalker is the name of it stalker full movie directed by andre Tarkovsky and it's kind of a, a similar thing and they go to this area that's off limits and it's all kind of somewhat overgrown obviously was inhabited everybody's left some of the people remember it but certain plants won't grow there they tore up certain other plants it's strange he talks a lot about the, you know the ill-famed population idle, thieving, deceitful people. Yeah, nobody really knows that. They, he believes what he's told. And 
The fault does not lie with the soil, which with plentiful irrigation at present and practicable and at present only practicable along the sides of the mountains proves very fertile. But with the parched and arid winds of, the, of Central Asia in former ages, a widely ramified system of canalization, that means a system of canals, replaced natural irrigation. But this has been destroyed by the Persians, and in modern times it has neither been restored nor has the country been repopulated. In other words, it's depopulated. And he talks about politics. It goes on and on. Oh my gosh, I read so much about politics. Garbage. <laughs> about 6,000 square miles. What did it say? Uh, 6,000 square miles with a population of... Um, what was the population? 371,000 inhabitants. According to the census of 1867. Much less at the time he's going through. So the Tartars, which kind of auto, this is like an auto translation, so it was TA7 Dars, <laughs> kind of like hobo coat. Some mountain tribes, as for instance the Swanethians, basically the same thing. The Swanethians, 900,000 strong, at one, I guess at one point, I don't know. So I picked out parts from all the political talk that I thought were interesting. It's very extraordinary, he says. It's a very, it is a very extraordinary circumstance that the great number of small tribes in Dagestan, which are crowded together in a few villages and even in a few huts, should still speak their own language, understood by none of their neighbors. How does that happen? This shows how here every migration of a tribe from the earliest ages of mankind has left traces behind it, which, behind it, which have frequently, by the force of circumstances, been nearly obliterated, but never entirely extinguished. So we're talking about the different languages from the Tower of Babel, I think, is what we're talking about here. Because clearly you don't develop additional separate languages. The reason you can understand me speaking English, if you can, is because most of the world speaks English or understands it because it convalesces, it coalesces into one, not the other way around. The soil is damp and muddy. The throwing up of the bankmen of the railway not only necessitated great labor, but the lives of numerous work workmen. See, they say that the workmen died of disease and whatnot because you ask around and you don't find any workmen. Nobody knows who built it. Well, they all died of the dang fever or mosquitoes or whatever. And they say scarcely one of the soldiers employed in the construction of the line has escaped the marsh fever. <laughs> No, it's because nobody built it. It was built a long time ago. In some places, the laying down of the railway has produced the most melancholy results because of the deficiency of proper drainage under the embankment. See, the stagnancy of water in the soil in large patches of the forest have completely died away. Well, that's because the, the drainage was there. It's just that the lack of upkeep over decades or centuries since it was depopulated... Whatever happened to the population, no one knows. There's not graveyards, not many graveyards. There's not bones or anything. It's almost as if the rapture had happened, you know. <laughs> but uh, when the drainage culverts, the when you build a railroad, you have to raise it. And so the natural drainage along the landscape gets interrupted. So you have to have culverts to allow that drainage to go through. And people who build railroads know this. He's pretending that they didn't know that, and when they built it, then the large sections of forest died and made marshes. And that the people building the railroad, even though it wouldn't have been a problem yet because they were just building it and moving on, that it caused a lot of mosquitoes, which caused a lot of dang fever. And then they were all killed from the dang fever, and only scarcely one person is left who says he built it, and he's probably a liar. And eventually they clear out the culverts and then it drains, a, drains away properly. And then the dead patches of forest and the rotten trees, hideous pools of muddy water drains out. And the nauseous spectacle returns to the rich, abundant foliage that it once was. And then he says this, which I found very interesting. He said, I, nor can I say that the virgin forest conjured up romantic notions of a satisfactory impression upon my mind. It's because it's not virgin forest. On the contrary, I found this luxuriant vegetation to be thick. It impregnates the atmosphere with poisonous vapors, harassing and oppressive. Not a living soul inhabits the place. The receipts at the train station that he stopped at 
for the first year of operation scarcely seems to have amounted to five rubles. That's the train. So he's on this train that was just this disused uh, train that had just been reopened by the military that allowed them to travel through the area. And we're just getting started. <laughs> and the soil looks fertile, but it's somewhat poisoned. Covered with weeds. Uh, their houses and different buildings and things, wooden buildings. People, it's weird because they, they have these stone buildings that are overgrown, but the people dwell in these wooden buildings. It's almost like a superstition that they can't dwell in these bigger buildings. It's probably be, because soldiers would just kind of root them out, so they're kind of like camping around places, you know. So he talks about, there's a, a high roads they lead to these different villages some of them have palaces that were formerly capitals princely families lived there but of course they were deposed and they have iron immense iron bridges every portion of which down to the final nail has been brought from england which spans a large river it it's a rapid stream fills up in the rainy season uh no it wasn't brought in that's just the worldwide architecture that's everywhere but wait till he keeps going because that it just gets more and more strange as as he goes along because the way of traveling widens and narrows to extremes and it he catches glimpses of what he thought was a pyramid a long pointed crest far away it, it probably was just completely overgrown but you can't tell if it's a mountain or a pyramid now here this is interesting because to they wandered through the interior of a monastery that they found. The church is of a Byzantine central edifice with a cupola covered over by a conical green roof, a constantly recurring feature in the Caucasus. Giants must have aided in its construction, which dates from about the 11th century, for the dimensions of the stone surpass everything which I have ever witnessed. Yet the work has been executed to such a nicety that the joinings are as distinct and regular at the present time, as they must have been 700 years ago. The walls, especially in the vicinity of the portals and windows, are adorned with flat relevi, an art in which the Byzantines were masters. In purity of design and as regards to the ingenuity displayed in richly decorating naked services without overloading them, our own architects still have much to learn from the giants. <laughs> but that's like Gilded Age construction. And this guy's German, so he's seen a lot. I mean, he had probably seen the Cologne Cathedral. <laughs> and this impressed him. And that's the Monastery of Gelati, okay? The Monastery of... The interior of the church exhibits the customary form of a cross. The walls are completely lined with frescoes, among which two periods may be recognized. Some of the paintings are in the severe repulsive style of later... Byzantine art, whilst others have evidently been restored in the Middle Ages and at the time when the Italian school of painting was in full bloom. Because everything has to go through one city, right? So there are different inscriptions, some of it's gold, ecclesiastical. Uh, he went into one place with where there was a remarkable object known as the, as the crown of the Imerician kings. I don't know if that's translated right a kind of hood covered with pearls adorned with gold bands and buckles it sounds guadi and with the cross at the top wearing the crown on their heads many of the earlier kings generally possessing handsome faces like me and a mass of reddish hair are represented in the frescoes of the church i don't have reddish hair though so the iron gates uh all kinds of very posh well constructed things so here just the way he's traveling from one masterpiece of architecture to another, just getting there through the main road is so treacherous, it, it narrows down to where you're walking across a path that barely, like a, like a mule can barely cross. And they had to walk along these rivers on these embankments up high above, like on a rocky ledge above torrents of water. So at night, this time, he walked across the torrent, which had compelled us to retrace our steps, was 
Not so formidable when viewed by daylight, still it would have been imprudent to advance further into the gorge at night. The road was only broad enough for one horse to pass at the time, and whilst to the left, the rock rose perpendicularly into the air to the right, in the depths below the Ayan was foaming. That's the river. So the place they were going was at the end of the gorge. The road was interrupted. The bridge over it, over the considerable stream, was carried away by the waters. It must have been a makeshift bridge. We may have had an accident here in the dark. Beyond, in the broad, in the sunlight, they did. But um, they, they're they traveling along, and just what they keep seeing, this happens a lot. He looks up and sees that the summit of a hill nearby was crowned by an old ruined castle. That happens so many times. There's just so much there that even, like, they're not supposed to know about that he just mentions it's probably destroyed in the meantime and you can't look it up. It's nowhere to be found. But he talks about the Tartar language. Its dimensions are fabulous. Yeah, all these things. Earthenware jug. It's a jug. Eight feet in height, four feet in diameter. Buried up to the neck in the corner of the Ducan. I don't know what that is. So, that was some wine. The path, uh, impassable for European horses, was made a little broader. At one spot we met occupied in mining the rock about 30 wild-looking workmen clad in picturesque rags. They weren't mining, guys. They weren't mining. Some of the mines were being charged with powder at the moment we were passing by as the men greeted us most cordially. They gave no intimation of the explosion about to take place. We quietly continued on our journey. Our terror may be imagined when the charges went off a few paces behind us and stones were sent flying in all directions. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But the proceeding was rather unceremonious. There were a thousand echoes produced by the report. That's the sound, the bang. So they're just blowing shit up. They're not mining. They were destroying the architecture, like how he looked up and saw the grand castle on the hill. They were still in the process of destroying it in the late 1800s so then they meet these uh, like uh, highfalutin people guy in Ger- speaking German er spricht auch Deutsch er war zivilisiert and in the Crimean region and he was paid 2,000 rubles a salary far beyond the reach of any Prussian magistrates and to administer the law and on account of the distances he had Absolute power, without appeal, over the mountaineers and the and the Dadish Kilian Swanivians, basically everybody over there. So he decided one thousand two hundred civil and two hundred criminal cases a year, something like that. And he had a, a co-worker who was a Warsaw Jew, and they were very nice to him, and had a very fine dinner and lived in luxury and. It was one of the greatest events of the journey for him. And he said it was very similar to that of our Tartar dinner, but had an odd mixture of people who composed the society who were at the dinner he was at. The guests were all natives of the country, um, other than him. And he talked about all the different characters there. It's quite interesting. It makes me think of the movie Chitty Chitty Bang Bang when they're meeting the king and there's all these weirdos wearing purple type of thing. But he comes across more castles. Uh, the ones he names, I think a lot of them are still in existence. I looked up a few, and they're pretty fabulous. Castle Orbeli. And he found one really big tree, 33 feet. There's the 33 drop. Circumference, 6 feet above the grade. Uh, he talks a lot about the wildlife and the you know, nature, the vegetation. Although several villages are described on the map belonging to this tract of land, we only discovered from time to time a few miserable huts, almost entirely hidden away amongst the dense virtue. On one occasion, however, we fell in with a small crushing mill lane close to our path, but far from any human abode, a woman, uh, a woman, a wooden hammer striking merrily on a shell was set in motion by a rivulet. But I could not ascertain for what purpose this apparatus should exist in the solitary depths of a forest. The traveler in these parts met with similar isolated machines, uh, the person they were traveling with. 
there's isolated machines that are still functioning, but they everything else around them is wiped out. It was automatic. It was running automatically. On the road, we encountered the first Swanethian, a sturdy fellow whose felt hat, shaped into the Tyrolese fashion, occasioned us a much astonishment. He carried his gun in a case of badger skin. He wouldn't part with his gun. Very little traffic in this valley. A few peasants with pack horses going up and down the road. That's it. Very strange. The villages are on the map, and there are no villages there. A peculiarity, however, attracted our attention. The vines, they ran up stone pillars and then across lathworks ex extending up and down the village street. A peculiarity, which I never again noticed in the Caucasus. Modern culture has, really, has reached in the form of a schoolmaster whose credentials to European education seem to be represented by a knowledge of the language <laughs> and by the possession of a broad-brimmed felt hat. <laughs> In other words, he wasn't educated at all, but he was the educator of the region because he was indoctrinating. Ill-accorded with his national costume, he honestly confessed himself that attendance at school was far from being regularly conducted, but they had already started compulsory indoctrination. They had a comfortable journey along the way. There's a few people around, not very many, but the people who are there are getting compulsory indoctrination. <laughs> He talks about uh, primeval forest of fir trees, but the proportions are five times greater than in the Hartz Mountains, whilst ever and anon a stray laurel bush recalls to mind the southern latitude. I just thought that was interesting. I'm interested in trees. But they're at a fairly high altitude. Stately farms built of stone with walls and massive towers crowned by battlements. These towers, some of which measure 80 feet in height, are built of stone and cement and are invariably square and strongly constructed. They're quite in harmony with the customs of the country. Behind these towers, the Swanevians, these are the t stone towers of blood revenge. <laughs> this is the story. Behind these Towers, the Swanevian, having committed a murder, retires for safety, dreading the old law of vendetta. Vendetta is an Italian word for vendetta, which, in spite of the first elements of civilization having penetrated into those regions, still reigns supreme. And there he remains protected by thick walls against every attack from without, like Rapunzel, until the deed has been atoned for by the payment of blood money. Hence, stone towers of blood revenge. Or until grass has grown over it by the lapse of time. Then it's not a stone tower of blood revenge. It's a grass-grown tower of non-vendetta. <laughs> the villages produced a pleasing impression. The, far <laughs> the farms were in good substantial condition. The road and bridges kept in repair. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, after the population is pretty much wiped out. <laughs> but these mighty towers... So many of them, because apparently so many of them were murderers and needed these stone towers of blood revenge. It created basically a complex of mighty towers, crowned by battlements, caused it to resemble a city. It resembled a city, such as we find represented by the old Italian masters, the clearness and tranquility of the atmosphere. That's what murderers, that's the atmosphere of murderers, allows us uh, with the naked eye at a distance of more than five miles to count the number of the battlements, and we could even hear the roar of Ingir, that's a river, at some distance. <laughs> but, again, it's destruction by design everywhere the guy goes. Uh, I perceive some scantily wooded valleys and in regards to the lofty castles, which, according to Murray, crown the heights on every side, I only noticed here... Uh, a single crumbling old ruin. So, um, he said the heat was intolerable. Da, 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 da. And it had a railway that runs along the side of the road. An engine had come off the rails and had capsized and enjoyed its repose after the fatigue of ascending such unheard of gradients. And, uh, there situated below the old castle. So, all unoccupied, destroyed. And again, here's another one. The railway made a wide bend to the south. 
in another town situated at the foot of a pass is a small spot above which towers a castle erected on an isolated rock. And then they have some impossible story of how it was constructed. And one of them, they, I think they all got the fever as they're traveling along. They did all get a fever. <laughs> the um, obligatory fever that everybody would get, apparently. And I've heard that about people who go to the Amazon. It's just like a matter of time. Most of them get that. But uh, they came across a monastery and just constantly stumbling upon churches, chapels, wonderful architecture that wonderful architecture of which points to a greater period of art and uh, little villages fine scenery a massive forest of fruit trees after many centuries of neglect had grown wild a massive forest of fruit trees imagine that the monastery was in good repair built of stone tiles and uh, they found all kinds of little ruins light-colored stone, architectural ornamentation, a little jewel in the rock, just here and there that just escaped the constru or destruction. Construction that escaped the destruction. So, in every direction. It's so mysterious and lovely an aspect, I would urge any travelers travel and make these excursions, which can only be done on foot. So how'd they build it? It's regrettable that no photographs of these exquisite specimens of architecture can be purchased. It is true that the prince, on behalf of the government, caused photographs to be made of the finest examples of ecclesiastical architecture arranged with great taste in a valuable album, but a limited number of copies has been taken owing to want of demand for them. I could not ascertain where the plates were to be found from the chapel. So, in other words... They say only one person can photograph them, and then he doesn't really have the photographs that anybody can get, and then it just doesn't even exist, and then there are no photographs of it, and then they destroy it. And other than him writing about it here, nobody may have ever known about it now, today. And it, it's just a whole book of stuff like this. Meanwhile, there's hardly a person to be found. They travel and travel for days and days, come across a few people here and there, and that's it. It's incredible, really. And it's a shame. And here he talks about a snipe, <laughs> woodcock and a snipe. I thought snipe were fake. <laughs> I thought it's like a Mandela effect to me because I thought snipe wasn't a real thing that you could hunt. I thought hunting snipe was like a joke. But And here's the monastery, one of the monasteries he came across. And the, doesn't that look like train tunnels to you? <laughs> On the right, I mean, and left but that's just like a portal there it makes no sense the construction of this if it was carved out this way it makes no sense and then some of it's built up by blocks where do the blocks begin and end why do the steps go to nowhere it's Vardzia. that's a monastery i uh i mean a picture is worth a thousand words just look at the screen now that's a train tunnel folks it's got the train tunnel going one way and the other way the bridge is gone and the massive building that was there, it's just in ruins and it's been completely buried and remineralized in floodwaters under great pressure. And I don't know what else to say. I mean, what else can you make out of it? You think people carved all this? You can see construction features in it, melted stairways. It's not necessarily melted, but it could be just remineralized in the form of what was once there. And the mud just kind of sloughs and settles. I don't know. Looks kind of like melted ice cream, a lot of it. And the tunnel passageways were filled in with the remineralization. And then they they did carve out some stuff out of it, but when they're carving along and they come across the natural features, it just kind of falls off into that shape, I believe. The floors were interesting to me. And it just makes no sense to have these hard structure portals built like that. You see archways all over in the so-called natural landscape. The paths, the blocks, the bricks, stone blocks, they just meld into the landscape. They're everywhere. The the dimensions are enormous. This is just the one spot, Vardzia. And uh, it's a little bit more touristy and well-known among the different spots, and I hope to find some of the other things that he was talking about. But here's some of the so-called Byzantine art with the medieval 
kind of overwrite to it where it was kind of uh, gone over by somebody with some, supposedly some latter less Byzantine and more medieval slash Renaissance tastes. But again, out almost you know in the wilderness, almost like far away from these other structures, they have these porticos, these things of imp- these impressions and stone of these uh, different shapes. And then some of the vestiges of the old civilization, like this bridge that remain, are incredible wonders of architecture. It's a masterpiece. Do you think you could do that today with stones and, and have the confidence to cross that bridge? I wouldn't have the confidence to cross that bridge uh, if if I had made it. <laughs> Somebody else did. And this is this is just something that makes zero sense unless you look look at the ground beneath Paris and and London with all the tunnels going the different directions and the underground there and realize that's just what this is. There's a city above it. And there's a subway, and there's drainage tunnels and different tunnels there, and and some of it remains. What is that structure to the left of those, what I think are train tunnels there going up? It's like a chimney or something. And you go inside, and what did they do? Did they carve that? No, it's like bricks and blocks. It's The interior is very large, the windows... uh, (laughs) How is the floor made? I think it's artificial. And you can see the windows and the cross tunnels and the passageways. And I think they have the artificial floors because they raise up the floor to make it seem like people weren't that tall. I'm not sure. But who knows what this was? That could have been a sewer for all we know. This painting of the chariot in the sky. The people look like giants in the painting. Of course, it's got the millennial rain imagery of... Angels dwelling with humans. They have wings, the angelic and the humans, and glorified bodies. Artwork tells the tale, if you think about it. It's kind of the golden age, literally. It's in gold leaf much of the time there. The dimensions, proportions of the people seem to be like they're giants, but it's not the kind of art that is really like super like hyper realistic it's kind of the cartoonish type art which makes me think it did come in later and it's kind of perhaps misleading although it's a style of art that is meant not to be too realistic because that was seen supposedly as blasphemy now why would anybody carve it like this it just doesn't make any you can see the blocks and the bricks and how some of the mountain is just pure structure uh going up and the tunnels, like the doors within the doors, very interesting. The artwork on that tells me that that artwork is not from the original civilizations. So it makes sense that that's like the kind of cartoonish, like kids drawings, kind of crummyish artwork. And then in the interior, there's a house in the interior. <laughs> I mean, why would you, that's like, it's like a kid building a tent inside the house because I see dead people or something like that, you know, like scared or whatever. That's a reference to the Sixth Sense, the movie, which isn't a very good movie. I recommend watching it. But the tunnel dimensions, there's the artificial floor. It's it's more of just like a drainage pipe or a water pipe or something like that, if you ask me. And they just pour concrete in the floor and make it, oh, well, this was a carved out tunnel. But you look at the upper part of the mountain, and of course there's, it's adorned with kind of a castle at the top that they pretty much destroyed, but there's all the... Where does the natural stone begin and the blocks end and vice versa? It's hard to say. And whatever they build up there is no more. Just like the video, we're done. And I wish you well. Hope you enjoyed it. This is Douglas.